Welcome to Transformers, the podcast about how business people and policymakers are creating a sustainable future. I'm your host, Kai Embren. Today's guest is Uffe Elbeck, a journalist, politician and a system entrepreneur. He has been Minister of Culture in Denmark and since 2011, Uffe is a member of the Danish Parliament. Uffe is a founder and former principal of the Chaos Pilot, an international school of new business design and social innovation located in Aarhus, Denmark. Politics has always been a part of Uffe's life, from social liberals, the alternative to the independent Green Party. Uffe is also an author and has been a regular columnist for a number of news media and has over the years received several recognitions and awards. This episode with Uffe, part two, will focus on his life in politics and society. Welcome, Uffe. Thank you very much. <laughs> you stepped down as a principal or a CEO of Chaos Pilot in 2006, and uh, your engagement in society didn't uh, run out with that. My plan was to move to Berlin together with my husband, Jens, but uh, then the world, in a way, called for me in a very, very exciting and uh, meaningful way because I was asked to to be the CEO of, of World Out Games uh, 2009 in Copenhagen, the biggest uh, international global event for LGBT people at that time. It was an event that covered both uh, sports, uh, culture and human rights. And for more than a week, everyone in Copenhagen was colored in rainbow colors, so to speak. It was a magical moment for the city uh, for for more than a week uh, that LGBT people could uh, celebrate their lifestyle and dreams and hopes and political ambition. And uh, thousands of people arrived to Copenhagen from all corners of the world. And for me uh, to be in charge of that program and to be the uh, spokesperson and the face, so to speak, it was really a privilege personally uh, for me to be part of. Because what I learned through uh, that event and the work uh, around it was how important diversity in all its uh, meaning is for a society. Because uh, if you as a gay man, which I am, or a lesbian, or a bisexual, or a trans uh, person, to give uh, space for that person's uh, way of living is also freedom for everyone else. And we had, we had a slogan uh, for the event called Love of Freedom, Freedom to Love. That was the headline for, for the event. How can we create a very diverse society that celebrates freedom and uh, on top of that, freedom to be who you are and uh, live with the person you would like to live and love the person you like to love. So it it was so essential uh, values we were working with. That week was one big love celebration in Copenhagen. It was a focus on human rights and what happens happens with the LGBT people around the world. How many many people who are shot, murdered, uh, jailed just because of their sexuality. After that event and uh, being responsible for that, I will always uh, have diversity as uh, one of my core uh, political focus in my work, because I, I, if a, a society is not uh, diverse, I don't think it can be you know, innovative and uh, create new ideas. And uh, the development, development of the society will end in the wrong corner, so to speak. So to create a society where each of us, depend, whatever sexuality, whatever religions, religious, feelings we have, whatever political uh, hu- use, uh, attitude we have, how can we create a society where everyone feels that uh, they are home and they are able to be who they are. 
So looking back on what happened with the World Out Games in Copenhagen, that had for sure colored my way of being and the way I understand politics. And uh, one thing is to change the law uh, in the parliament when it comes to LGBT people. Another way, another thing is to change people's mindsets. And if we look at the more legal stuff, I think Denmark is quite home safe. There is always uh, stuff to do better. Uh, but the next big challenge is to how how one thing is the legal change, another thing is to change people's mindset. And how do you change people's mindset? We are right now in a situation, both here in Denmark and in Europe and in the world as so, where we really see conflicts between them and us, this tribe feeling. And if we look into what is happening in Europe right now, in 2015, it was the refugees who was the scapegoats. But today it's, uh, it's uh, feminists and it's LGBT people. Look at what is happening in Poland, look at what is happening in Hungary, uh, look at what is happening in Russia, look at sometimes what is happening in the US. Uh, for me, it's a shock that we can say that we are living in 2021 and still this is an issue that people are so afraid when they really feel what can happen with people if they're able to be who they are and love the people they would like to love. LGBT, the LGBT agenda, Q and agenda, is so close to my heart, and uh, I, it's like what I'm breathing every day, and I'll always stand up for the LGBTQ agenda because it's so much more than the LGBTQ agenda. It's, it's about freedom, it's about democracy, it's about diversity, it's about the right to be who you are and love the one you would like to love. Well, uh, let, let us go into a little bit more of politics, even if we have touched by it uh, under the talk today. But uh, uh, if we look into uh, when Denmark was on the map the, the last week, uh, when we talk about the climate issue, yeah, yeah. Uh, that have always been high on the agenda for you. And, and, and at the last week, Denmark say it's putting an end to the fossil fuel area by stopping all new oil and gas exploration. Yeah. How will that fit into your activism in a way I, I would have loved to say that denmark are doing well and uh, that uh, the minister minister for climate is uh, really the front runner but uh, and everyone thinks that's the case of course on a symbolic level it's always important when a country announces that they're closing down the oil production gas production that's a big step but seen from the inside of the Danish discussion, I have to say that I'm totally not uh, satisfied because yes, we, are, we will have the last drop of oil coming up of the North Sea in uh, 2050, but that's way too long uh, to go. If, if we should live up to the Paris Agreement and uh, live up to what the climate scientists are saying, First of all, we should let more than 80% of the oil uh, resources stay in grounds. And for sure, uh, we should stop all oil production in 2030. So 20 years before where the, the end goal is today. And I'm not, of course, I, I'm in a dilemma because I would like to be a proud Dane uh, and say, yeah, we did it. And uh, who won't like to read great uh, editorials in The Guardian and New York Times about that uh, Denmark are the first country uh, closing down the oil production. But, um, but I have to say, uh, the timeline is not ambitious enough. And uh, of course, the government is saying, yeah, but the, the great uh, 
uh, consequence of this uh, uh, climate deal here in Denmark is that we have got uh, all parties from both sides uh, of the floor involved in this so it's a very stable agreement and of course that's also true mm -hmm. but uh, seen from a young person's point of view i agree with the young people many challenges of course uh, as a nation we are a small country but uh, compared to eu we are the highest oil uh, biggest oil producer in in the eu countries so uh, when it comes to oil we are a quite big player, not as big as Norway, but but uh, in the EU we are the biggest. And if we decide to say we're going to close that, this business down, of course it's a very important message uh, to the rest of the world for sure, because we put pressure uh, right now on Norway and England, uh, UK. When are you going to close down your oil production? Uh, so in that in that perspective, it's good. And uh, then I'm a proud day. We are the mirror in your eyes. We are the voice of written songs. We are one world. We go into your political life and, and looking into different uh, engagement and, and constellation you have been working through the years. And, and I have seen you active as a social liberal or you created the alternative and yeah. also involved in the independent Green Party. Why this engagement in different constellations? When I, I was a young, a young person, in the 70s, I was uh, very involved on the, the most left-wing parties and organizations in Denmark. But uh, around uh, 1981, I get fed up with the way we talked on the left. Uh, we were always against everything, but not that much for. Uh, so for near, the next nearly 18 years up to 98, I was not a member of any party. And the only reason why I decided to go into traditional politics again in 1998 was because of the Danish People's Party really were growing and started to be a very important political voice in Denmark. And I said, I can't accept that. Uh, I can't accept that uh, we have this uh, narrow-minded, uh, very nationalistic uh, approach. Uh, what we need is to open up work together, enjoy the diversity in our society, etc. So I, I said, I have to do something. And at that time, I have been so much doing my own stuff, created the Front Runners, the youth organization, the Front Runners. And if anyone uh, wants to check them out, please do that. They are still existing and uh, are very vibrant youth organization. I, I really loved to do stuff. Uh, concrete stuff. I wanted, uh, I had really come in very close contact with my entrepreneurial uh, DNA, but still uh, with a very leftist attitude. We have to create the good society for everyone, a much more equal society. And this very strange mix of entrepreneurial mindset and a leftist mindset. It was very difficult to find a party at that time on the left uh, who had this strange mix of leftist entrepreneurship. The second best choice, because the best didn't exist, was the so social liberal party in Denmark because they were entrepreneurial, but they had a social consciousness. I became a member there and uh, was voted in uh, at the city council in Aarhus and was. Uh, had some really good years on city level pol policy. I really like to be a city councillor actually because it's very concrete and uh, it's hands on and uh, you can see the concrete result of uh, your decision in the city. So I, I like the yeah, city policy. But um, in 2011, uh, I was asked to run on a national level 
And uh, I did that and uh, was voted in and became uh, for a period uh, Minister for Culture, uh, as you also mentioned, uh, Kai. Uh, mm. But uh, in 2013, I had a lot of issues with my, not only my own party, but also the government I represented. Because uh, when we were running for election in 2011, there was a lot of hope from uh, a lot of people in Denmark that now we are really getting out of the zeros uh, and with a conservative liberal government. And now we want a much more center-left government. And uh, it was just after the finance crisis. So the government had to do actually, they were doing the same kind of business as the uh, former government, a, a lot because of the finance crisis. But there was a lot of... Uh, frustration among the voters and also inside myself. There was some very important decision on the floor in the parliament, which uh, I couldn't agree with. So I, I had to step out, out of my party, which I have been working for so, for so many years. And uh, I said, uh, okay, should I just leave politics? Because that was also an opportunity. And uh, I was offered some very good work uh, opportunities. But um, at the end of the day, I said, no, I'm not finished with politics on the on national level. So I, I created uh, the alternative, which was the first really green party in, in Denmark and um, was the party leader uh, for the next seven years uh, for the, the alternative and uh, decided then one year ago to step down from my position because I thought now I'm a really, I am an old man now. So, so I said, now we need uh, the next uh, generation uh, to take over. And uh, it was a very happy moment for me to step down. But then there was a lot of internal infight uh, in the party. And uh, at, uh, it, so it ended with that uh, most of the MPs from the alternative left the party. It was during the corona lockdown this year and uh, i'm not i don't think i'm able actually to uh, to yeah to analyze it sober enough because it was very emotional i'm so mature that i know there's always two sides of a coin i have also played a role in in the internal conflicts but uh, we had to leave and uh, of course that was a strange personal experience that you have to leave the party you created yourself but uh, again then we have to create something better and uh, so we created uh, the independent greens uh, which is a new political party in denmark and um, we are right now in the process to get enough signatures so we can run for election next time and i hope that we will succeed uh, for me it's a uh, has been a very creative and important period r right now in the parliament because uh, uh, it's like we're dealing with some very, very principal questions, uh, which is extremely fascinating. And uh, we have come to some very tough decision about how we see where the world is heading and uh, what kind of a new kind of economic system is needed. So we are really in completely in the core of uh, most, maybe most important discussion in the world right now, how we go from the neoliberal economy to a post-capitalistic economy yeah. and what does that mean? So, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's heavy, heavy material uh, we are, and questions we are dealing with right now. But on the other hand, it's extremely meaningful uh, and uh, I'm really happy for where I am personally. And if I should uh, end this little answer is that when I decided to go down as party leader in uh, last year, which was really a heavy decision for me, then I also had to face a new kind of reality because it's the first time in 38 years that I'm not sitting at the end of the table. Uh, so I have to deal with all my egocentric fictions about being in the spotlight and be the person who had the last word, etc. And uh, for me, it's uh, so fascinating to figure out how to let go of your ego. I'm very, very, 
I, I feel I'm very privileged that I'm able to experience that when I'm still a very active MP uh, in the parliament and uh, involved in how to figure out to formulate the strategy for, for the future. Well, maybe, maybe you should raise that question to Trump. I think so. I think so. <laughs> I think he has an ego, a problem with his ego. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of experience of, of political work in, in, in society, but how do you see the political party's role in today's society? Is it the need of a new entrepreneurship and leadership? Can today's politics reach out to, to the young generation? And how? Uh, uh, I, I'm in doubt, to be honest, because, and, and again, if you look with a more global, uh, what we see right now is that way we understand the democracy as we know it from Scandinavia, uh, Europe, ish, that's under everywhere. Uh, there came a report out from uh, the think tank called uh, Freedom House uh, just uh, a few weeks ago. And out of, I think we are around 192 or three nations today. Out of that, 80 in 80 nations worldwide, democracy has gone back. And there was only one country where democracy has gone forward. Otherwise, it was status quo. But 80, 80 uh, countries that uh, where the democracy has been uh, had a negative uh, standard. What, what I see right now, the, the big dilemma is uh, and paradox is that actually we have to protect our democratic institutions as we know them today, but at the same time, we have to develop them in a much more involved uh, way. The more I look into these issues, I'm sure that we have to create a, yeah, we have to turn the democratic process 180 degrees around. So instead of uh, that the democratic decision starts in the, from the top and goes down from the state, from the parliament down to local level, we have to figure out how can we turn it around. So the democracy, the democratic process starts from the local level and up. And uh, we have to look into much more direct democracy. And uh, we have to look into the experience from uh, citizens assemblies uh, around the world. And luckily, there's a lot of good examples how you have used citizens' assemblies compared to ordinary parliamentarian structures. Uh, you've seen it in Madrid. They have been using the model with success. You've seen it uh, as different uh, cities like Gdansk in, uh, in Poland. You've seen it on national level in France with uh, Macron as a kind of a, a way to deal with the Yellow West. And uh, you've seen it in Copenhagen. Uh, we've been using uh, citizens' assembly as a tool for how to involve citizens much more directly in the democratic process. I think that uh, that uh, we we are in a situation where we have to understand that democracy, as we think we knew about it, are going to change. And either we are going to vitalize the, uh, democracy, and we are able to involve citizens much more directly in the process. Otherwise, we will see a period with a high degree of uh, populism and uh, especially right-wing populism. And uh, we'll see uh, a period where we don't know if facts are facts. There's so much fake news out there, so I can get that. I did a, pr a project uh, concerning uh, the Trump election. It's a good example that, that I don't know why I got on his list, but for the last four years, I have received maybe four, five, emails from uh, Trump every day from his campaign uh, office. So 
over the last four years, I maybe received more than 3,000 emails from Trump. And I started to look into it and, and were, start to be curious about how is there a pattern in the way he communicates. At the same time, I read a book called How Fascism Works by a guy called Jason Stanley. In that book, he lines up, I think, seven or eight indicators about what, what uh, does it take to create the possibility for a fascist uh, development. And if you use that parameters and look into the email from Trump, he used them all. He, create, he created a, a, a very romantic picture about uh, the past, how the uh, U.S. was before. Then he uh, in, enters an uh, enemy. He creates an enemy picture about some, someone who destroys this uh, romantic past. In this case, either the Mexicans or the Muslims. He starts to undermine the trust for the democratic institutions. He starts very early to say that the, that the, the, the election will, will be rigged. And uh, he starts to say that uh, you can't trust facts from the scientists. And uh, he, he says that the news, like uh, news media like uh, New York Times and the Washington Post, uh, are fake news, etc., etc. So if you look into what Trump did, and he still does, which is the scary shit, that he still sends me email three, four times a day, still after the election, saying that uh, he won the election and uh, Biden didn't. So it's just an example of what is going on right now politically around the world and uh, how you can use the tech tools to manipulate people and create a situation where each of us are living in our own echo chamber, our own bubble and then creates conflicts between us. So conflicts between people living uh, on the countryside with people living in the cities, conflicts between Christians and Muslims, co uh, conflicts with straight people and uh, LGBT people. We see it in, in uh, Poland and uh, Hungary uh, these days. So I have to be honest that we are, there was an Italian communist called uh, Gramsci who said that when the old system are dying, but the new is not still born, in enters the monsters. Then it's time for the monsters. If I have a blue day, I'm afraid that it is the time of the monsters. And then, of course, I get totally happy when Biden wins. But Biden is also one of the old guys and the established guy. Uh, but still, I was so happy. I, I had to drink at least one bottle of champagne that night and uh, heard the uh, Richard Franklin records. I was so happy that Biden was winning. But still, at a, if I have a blue day, I think that... Uh, Maybe this is a period where the monsters are entering because the old system are dying, but the new system is still so fragile. So they haven't found its own feet yet. Well, um, we, will we see the change in politics a year to come? Uh, have, have the populist era and climate crisis and the pandemics create a new playing field for politics? Of course, of course. Uh, uh, and and the, the, there are also very good examples that something positive is happening. For example, yesterday evening, the United Nations was sending out the information that there has never, never been as many refugees in the world as we have today. More than 80 million refugees right now. 80 million people who had to flee their home, either because of the of a civil war or war between nations, or because they can't live there anymore because of heat. Or that the, what I'm afraid is that if we don't do something radically, 
then we will see what I would call a p political perfect storm, where, for example, global inequality will feed into climate change, that will feed into religious conflicts, that will feed into uh, civil war, that will feed into maybe even uh, much bigger wars, and um, fight over resources, etc. And that's why we have to ask actually the tough questions right now. You can't, we have to figure out what kind of economic political model that will, are going to be de to design a post capitalist system. Because the way we're living and the way where we are heading, then we will end a very, very, very uh, awful place. So, Kai, you and I, our generation has to step up together with the young generation and say enough is enough. We have to design a totally different uh, way of organis organizing our societies. Well, I, I was thinking of how, how, how do you want to give the young generation a hope for the future? I know that we can get our stuff together uh, if we reach out to each other. What I, I, I look back to is uh, what, what created the first, what I would call uh, social innovation wave in the Danish society. Actually, it started in... Uh, 1814, uh, when we decided to, to uh, that it should be free educational system in Denmark for everyone from first to seventh grade. Uh, but what the interesting part of that story is that in the year before 1813, Denmark went bankrupt. Uh, we lost the war, in the Napoleon War. We were in alliance with France. We were on the wrong side of history. We lost not only Norway, we lost our navy. Denmark was completely bankrupt as a society back in 1813. And the year after, we decided to invest in the common good. And uh, from there, you saw all the different uh, movements in Denmark, the farmers' movements, the workers' movements, uh, the women's movement, etc., uh, etc., etc. et cetera. Et cetera, et cetera. It, it, and all these small different steps created what I would say the first social innovation wave in Denmark, which ended up with a welfare system as we know it. The question is, what is going to kickstart the second social innovation wave? If we look in, back to the to the past, it was not a big strategy from the finance uh, minister of finance or from the prime minister's uh, office. That's not where the welfare start, uh, welfare state started. It started with a very very simple action that ordinary people came together in meaningful communities and solved concrete problems. It was not a big master plan from uh, the parliament who started the world social innovation wave in Denmark. No, it was farmers who went to came together and uh, figured out how can we solve some of our issues in in the farm farming industry. It was uh, uh, citizens who came together and created the folk high, uh, folk high school system. It was uh, workers who came together and uh, organized the folk first co-op movement in Denmark, etc. So to answer your question, Kai, when, when I'm talking with young people, which I do on a daily basis, basic, I said, always say, start with talking with someone you trust. Share what, what you think is happening right now. Share what you are feeling, both good and bad feelings. And uh, start to figure out what can I do here and now with my own life together with the people who would like to join me. That was exactly what happened when uh, two years ago, 
inspired by Greta Thunberg, the Swedish young uh, climate activist, that a group of young, very young uh, uh, students here in Denmark said, we want to create the new green student movement. So let's start with a conversation. Oh, great. And uh, thank you for this conversation, Uffe. And, uh, yeah, and, uh, uh, and it was uh, great to meet you again, Kai. It's, yeah. it's been way, way yeah. long and time. I think, yeah, and I think it's important to, to tell the stories that life is full of challenges, uh, but it's also full of dreams. And yeah. then you can change uh, also things around you uh, if you start to uh, collaborate, yeah. Think about education and training and try to be the entrepreneurial uh, boy or girl yeah. and, and, and try to take the steps step by step. The, exactly. The, the world didn't change in one day. It's a no. hard work, but it's also full of dreams. Yeah, and, and uh, if you listen, there's a lot of weak signals in society today. And back to the Red Square in uh, 89. We didn't saw what was coming, but one month later, the Berlin Wall was coming down. And uh, yeah. it's the same story, it can happen again. I'm Kai Embren. Follow me on Twitter and LinkedIn, where I will be announcing the future guests to this podcast. And you can expect about two programs a month. And each guest has a unique story of making business and society sustainable. So find out more. Visit my homepage, kaiembren.org. Thank you for listening.